I'm very envious of Meredith when I think about globalism because by very virtue of movement and, and voice and, uh, and wordless communication, she's instantly speaking to a universal court. And when I listen to Meredith's work, what I hear is instantly the explosion of all boundaries. And somebody who can put on the same performance in Bali or West Africa or New York City and perhaps arouse some of the same emotions, but in each case, different emotions too. And I'm in that hapless position of any writer, which is trying to use words to get to wordlessness and trying uh, to write about whatever links us uh, through a language that itself uh, divides us. But as you probably know, when I, I wrote a book called The Global Soul, and I suppose the idea of that was that all of us willy-nilly are knit together into this global community. And yet nearly always we describe it either in terms of global data or global markets. We think of the fact you can send data across the world to Beijing in a second, that uh, you can send Pepsi to Ulaanbaatar tomorrow. Uh, and we think much less about people in whom all these global currents are swirling in indecipherable ways. And also I think we tend to describe it in terms of um, sort of lowest common denominator. Globalism often equals uh, McDonald's, Microsoft, and Britney Spears. Uh, I think if it is to have any redemption, and given that it's the reality in which we work, we have to alchemize it into possibility. Uh, we have to think about what links us at a deeper level, which is having the same fears or having the same yeah. sense of a, a relation to uh, a community or having the same you know, human longings. And one of the things I love that I heard, um, I was lucky enough to see Meredith perform in Santa Barbara three months ago. And at the end of it, she said, and all of you who know her work know that she's defined by so many hyphens that in some ways she makes nonsense of all the categories. And I think <laughs> you actually said... <laughs> that your work is outside all categories. Mm. And I thought that's exactly what I'm trying to do globally, that I hope to define myself outside the categories of traditional nation states. And sometimes I think, well, if I was to call myself an Indian in a traditional sense, maybe I would think of Pakistan as an enemy. If I was to think of myself as Engli English, since I was born in England and grew up there, maybe um, Indians would think of me as an enemy. Uh, if I were to call myself an American nowadays, uh, it would be dangerous to travel in many parts of the world. But by defining myself not in terms of any tribe, uh, I can actually be outside the divisions and enmities of, of my parents. And I notice when I'm in Toronto, say, and I meet someone from Pakistan, we have much more in common than apart because we're both bewildered people from South Asia trying to make our new lives in, in the new world. And so I, I suppose I just see globalism as the mixed destiny that we have to try to turn um, into possibility. But I think Meredith has been doing this before the word global even existed because your work is about touching I, people I, beyond... beyond yeah. Notions. I mean, I do. I've, I've based my life on some some notion of that there is universal, that there are universal. Um, what would I say? Universal strands that transcend culture. You know. So actually, for me, uh, music is something that does transcend culture. Mm -hmm. Although, of course, each each person, human being, is going to they're going to respond in a different way. Each person is going to have a different perception. So the way that I feel about it is that I try to lay something out that's evocative enough that each person can find their own way into it, and that would also be culturally as well. Because you know, uh, when uh, Ellen Fisher and I were just in Sri Lanka, we did a performance for a village, and we noticed that the way that people were responding to what would be very abstract kinds of things uh, were um, were very much um, having stories about having stories about like these sounds or having stories about this movement. So that was very particular to that group of people, and so and that was fine. So the way that I feel about it is that it's it's trying for this universal, in a sense, kind of impulse, and then from there people can respond in any way that they want to. I think people can't characterize your music. If somebody were to say it's from Tuvo or Tibet, I'd believe them. Uh, do, do you have that experience? If, well, you know, I always think that's, a, that's always a, a misunderstanding about my music because people hear it and they say, well, did you go and study in Tibet or did you go and study there? But it was really more um, being an archaeologist of my own voice. So it was actually working much more viscerally and, and, and in a sense digging down into my own instrument and, and knowing that there were all these different possibilities within my own voice, that within my voice were male and female, different ages, animal, vegetable, mineral, um, uh, you know, like landscape, character, ways of producing sound. And I think that when you go into something in a very um, deep way, in a very concentrated way, then actually all voices are within that. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's really going from the inside out. Yeah. And that, 
um, as soon as you're not doing a, like a pear-shaped tone, which is a Western European tradition, you are going to come across these sounds that do exist in a lot of different cultures just by your own trial and error, uh, trial and error working. And so then when people say, well, this reminds me of Balkan music, I, you know, I, would, I remember one time my first concert at the Whitney Museum, someone said, have you ever heard uh, none such explorer so-and-so and so-and-so -so, Balkan <laughs> music? And I had never heard it. And it was because I was using a glottal break, which is uh, in between the two registers of the voice. And so I realized that it's not that that's where it comes from, from me, but it, it may touch off memories or touch off associations that people have. And I feel you're also bringing lots and lots of centuries uh, into it, in some ways the collective memory. When, this may be a misunderstanding of your work, but when I listen to it or watch it, I feel you're almost recovering something ancestral in us, something archaic that's, that's lost within us and is inside us, but that gets lost in the postmodern swirl. And I almost feel as if you're grounding us in this new century where we're moving without traditional orientations in something fundamental that, that, that we need. It's like you said about the poignancy of the, of the global era is that we've lost all definitions and we've lost a sense of tradition and ritual. And I feel yeah. in your work the recovery of the stuff of, of classic cultures. Is that what you're Yes, about definitely. Or? I mean, I think that same revelation that I had, this was the mid-60s, uh, you know, when I was just uh, working with my voice and doing regular exercises, and then I just had a, a revelation. But I think that right away I also realized that it was really going to the ancient sources of utterance before language, actually, and that I was very aware of that right away, and that and the voice is has that kind of power and... Um, and that it does cycle around. Time is, it's really a timeless instrument. Mm. And I, I do think that in this world that we're living in, that where everything is going so quickly, mm -hmm. um, I think that we just have to also get back to stillness, that we actually have to get back to, well, what, what are the fundamental human energies? What is direct experience? Yeah. It's interesting, because I think if, if I were to characterize my work, I'd say it's about silence. But writing about silence, you're defeated before you begin. But you know, one of my books ended with the words, word, words fail us. Another of my books ended with poems of what we make of them. Another ended with a dream. And they're all ways to try to push at that barrier to the place where explanations and ideas give out. But you're already there, I mean, without, without having well, to push. I always push, love that. I always um, love that about your work, that, you're, that it's, here's a writer who's trying to get beyond words. Yeah. So I th always think that that's such an amazing thing. And I also think, I mean, to go back to what both of you have been saying, in terms of the changing times, I feel as a writer, the whole job has changed in, in the last 20 years because of the um, deluge of information. I remember the first time I went to Tibet, it was in 1985, and I felt with some, I thought with justification, that very few people I knew in my life would ever have the chance to go to Tibet. Mm -hmm. So my job as a writer was to be an emissary and a roving microphone and the eyes and ears of all the friends of mine in California who'd never go there, and just to take in as many sounds and smells and impressions and human faces as possible. And when I went back to Tibet uh, three years ago in, in, in this century, I felt that anyone in this room can go back after tonight's event, uh, turn on the Discovery channel, channel and be in parts of Western Tibet that none of us could ever physically get to, can uh, access Google Earth and, and um, see points in Eastern Tibet, you know, where the Dalai Lama was born, can walk through the Patala Palace on some web website. And that in some ways, um, when I went back to Tibet most recently, I had to think about the inner Tibet, and I felt the external Tibet is available to everyone lucky enough to have a computer or a television. And really, I had to think about how Tibet plays out in the imagination, the questions it raises about faith and skepticism, and also the parables it plays out that, that would apply to Bolivia or many countries in the world. But that at, when I go to Tibet or any place today, I'm going in a radically different way than I did in 1985 mm. because the audience has, has changed. And I, I always feel that when I began, people had too little information, and my job was almost like a journalist mm. to mm -hmm. give them information. Mm -hmm. Now I, ha I feel people have too much, and what I have to give them is stillness, space, a structure for processing the information, or just freedom from the information, a chance to leave that all behind and go off into the wilderness. Well, there is that difference between information and knowledge. Right. <laughs> and, and the kind of personal side to this. I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Because sure. I think, you know, the very fact that you turn on the TV and you think you know someone because you've, you've seen the pictures, mm -hmm. but you haven't met people. Mm -hmm. And in your story just now about performing in Sri Lanka, that kind of faith in human to human interaction mm -hmm. is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, a little bit more about that. Uh, Well, um, we were in this village of uh, Malagamana, which is uh, where Ellen Fisher 
actually lived in 1974, and she was studying the temple dancing of Sri Lanka. So it was um, very familiar to her, she, you know, and so it was actually such an amazing opportunity because uh, these were people that she knew very well, and they were also all dancers and musicians themselves, with, in a traditional forms, and this, uh, and so we did. <laughs> and so this was like Amer this was like American performance, but we did all kinds of. I mean, I sang some of my music. We danced to Bo Diddley. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, Ellen did a, a I mean, a, incredible um, um, dance, uh, you know, to other American music. And so it was just in a way showing little examples, but it certainly was not going to be a definitive, um, you know, uh, offering of all American culture. But I think that. To them, I, I guess, like my music, which you wouldn't exactly say is mainstream American music by any means, to them would probably be, you know, part of American culture. So that was very interesting. I you think know, that's one of the, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that's one of the things we often forget as travelers that the, one of the principal blessings or graces we can take to any place is a correction of what it is to be American. I find if I go to Syria, for example, uh, when I'm sitting in California, I'm I. I tell myself I know everything about Syria because I've read about Hafez Assad mm -hmm. and his family and I've followed the New York Times or whatever. And as soon as I arrive there, every stereotype flies out of the window. And the first person I meet, as you're saying, refutes everything I thought I knew. But one thing I tend to forget is that I am bringing to them a more nuanced and human and to that extent more sympathetic view of, of what America is. And mm -hmm. suddenly I'm rescuing them from abstraction too. And I think um, that's why people often say, well, there's less reason to travel now because we have access to so many cultures, even because we can meet a Syrian by walking you know, three blocks away from here. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's actually a great function that we can serve, by, not just for ourselves, but for the people we visit, um, in being their human breathing newspapers mm -hmm. in some ways. I was wondering um, now what you were saying that you're going towards silence and the, and the way that you're writing when you go to some place because I was wondering how that works in relation to like one of the things I love about your writing is this incredibly acute um, observation, very detailed observation and um, you know discriminating um, intelligence in, in an environment and, and, and the way that you recreate an atmosphere because of these details. And so I was wondering now yeah. So now that when you went back to Tibet this time, I was wondering how then now what are you trying to, what are you actually trying to do in the writing? Yeah, that's a really good question because I feel that sometimes observation gets in the way of vision and sometimes actually detail, as you were suggesting, gets in the way of, uh, of knowledge. So I suppose I'm trying to, where I used to saturate the page with details in the way you're describing and really give a close-up and just throw the reader and myself into Los Angeles airport or the bustling <laughs> yes. marketplace of Tibet. And I'll never be in an airport again without thinking of you. <laughs> I have to say that in the global soul, he lived in the airport for, it was like three days or something That's like two that? Two weeks. Yeah, and I'm lucky to be here today like, because so I barely now, survived. Now every time I'm in an airport, which is all the time, I just go, how did Pico do it? You know, it's just well, like the culture I, of the airport. I did it so that you don't have to do it now. It was. I'm I really glad. I suffered vicariously. I'm glad. Um, but I mean, one of the questions I've always carried through with me is sort of what you were saying, which is how do you lead a Thoreauvian life in the middle of shopping malls and airports yeah. and MTV fragmentation? Because Thoreau and Emerson have been my talismans all along, but I figure that I can't go to Walden Pond. I have to find that stillness in the middle of Times Square. But your question is a, is, a, is a very, very good one. And I think maybe one way that I've changed is by virtue of living in Japan. And I think Japan, for me, and this is, is an education in attention and learning to listen. And I found when I went to Japan from California, I was more than ready to babble on as I'm doing now. But I hadn't learned the art of, of, of trying to listen to other people. And I thought, well, that's something that they have in such a refined Very way. So. Um, you, you have it too. But the, the example that I often use is if, if I go to a coffee shop with some, a Japanese person I've just met and I order Earl Grey tea and apple pie, I'll go to her house seven years later and there's Earl Grey tea and apple pie. She has registered everything about mm. my detail, even though they, they have no importance in her life. But she, she wants to know who I am and what I care about. Um, the, the one time I went to Meredith's house, she'd done exactly the same. So I think you don't need to go to Japan. <laughs> I think um, he needs milk in his tea. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you remember that. But if, and of course, um, the, the, the Japanese are, you could say, much better at, at listening than speaking. But certainly, they have a due, re due deference towards silence and the white spaces on a page. And so I went, when I went over to Japan, from California, but really from New York City, my feeling was if I had a page, I wanted to fill it with as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And now I'll fill it maybe with a single brushstroke and mm -hmm. try and let the, the, the reader take, take it where she wants to go. And so in terms of your 
specific question about Tibet. Um, I think when I first went to Tibet in 1985, I gave the reader, whether she wanted it or not, this saturated sensory immersion experience is equivalent to watching it on a screen. What I would do now is just perhaps present one person walking around the, around the street, around the Jokang Temple in the center of Tibet, um, with a question on his face, or um, in front of monks who are holding out their hands asking for money, and just present that conundrum and ask the reader to take it wherever um, he wants to take it. And uh, when I heard you perform in, in Santa Barbara three months ago, you said, what I'm really interested in is the unknown. And I think that spoke to me, because that's what, I suppose, pr previously I was more interested in, in gaining and imparting knowledge. And now I'm interested in going to those places where I have not a clue what's going on. But so, to feel so that also has to do with the fact that you're writing novels. That's, that's right. That's a big difference, Which right? is a journey into the dark, as mm -hmm. I see it. I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. of nonfiction as a gathering of a uh, lot of data and making an order and making a stained glass hole, hole out of it. And so that the, at the end of reading or writing, uh, 30-page article, you feel that you've come to some provisional conclusion. Whereas I think with fiction, it's like driving out into the desert after dark with your headlights out. You don't know what's going to come out <laughs> exactly. at you or from you. And things mm -hmm. that come out from you, which is from your subconscious, are things you wish were not even there. Mm -hmm. But it's really a journey into mystery. Mm -hmm. It's like Peter Brook talks about being a guide at night. Uh, and, uh, and not towards knowledge, but into a, a warmer um, accommodation with all the things that you don't know. And I think that's probably, I mean, your, your pieces are a set in the middle of mystery. In some well, ways, I, th I, think. I think the process is one of mystery, and I think that one of the things of being an artist is actually to have the endurance to suffer through being in the, you know, to hang out in the unknown. It's actually incredibly uncomfortable. So I think one of the things about being an artist is actually tolerate, you know, being able to tolerate that, that you literally are, you know, I think that the thing that you're talking about, the dark is interesting because I always feel like the way that I say it is it's a little bit like I'm, e I'm either blind or I'm kind of flailing about in the dark trying to find what the piece wants. It's really like trying to be open enough to let the piece speak for itself. And that's very difficult because you want an answer or, you know, it's, it's, you have to sit with it. There's a lot of waiting yeah. involved. And it's about surrender more than control. When I yeah. went from New York to Japan, a small part of me thought I'm going from a culture where there's a lot of thought about control to one where there's a lot about, about surrender and mm -hmm. about losing yourself in, in the person you're talking to mm -hmm. rather than asserting yourself. Yeah. And people defining themselves, the identity in terms of a community or a family or a company or mm -hmm. that, that famous gift that many cultures in East Asia have mm -hmm. for not talking of, of me, but, mm -hmm. but, but of, of us. The, the place where my, my wife, and Japanese wife, has been working in the same shop for many, many years, and I don't even know the name of her boss there, because she calls her boss department head. But, but, but you, you're just, it's in, so it's not an imposition from above. It's mm -hmm. trying to find what is coming out of you. In, I think the, the great experiences that I've had that I can count on one hand in my 41 years of working have been these pieces that seem to make themselves. Mm -hmm. And I always think that it's, the, it's in some other dimension. The piece is already in some other dimension, and then it's really a matter of trying to find the laws of that piece it's, or what the piece wants. It's like, what are the laws? What are the principles of that piece that already exist? And then, you, and then you know, hopefully you do find them. But that doesn't happen. You know, then in between, you have to be a good shoemaker in between the times that you have pieces like that because you have to keep your craft going. But that's, those are the great, great experiences where you do really feel that you're just... Um, you know, you're in some ways just a conduit for something that already exists. Have you found over the 41 years a way to find that, or to find? Um, you know, I think, I think as the years go on, in some ways it gets more difficult because you have a backpack of experience and of, of different ways of doing things. So in a way, I think the most exciting thing is to try to find a, a new method mm -hmm. as you go along as well. I mean, I keep on trying to figure out ways to get myself to the edge of the cliff every time. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then, and then, of course, when I'm working on something like that and I'm just going, yeah, great words, now I'm struggling like to do this. Why have I done this to myself? You know, but I think at the same time, it's what keeps things very, very interesting, yeah. that there isn't just a routine or yeah. you know, kind of habitual behavior. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that's really wonderful about art is that it actually can break through habitual behavior and you know that's what you try that's what you're literally trying to do as an artist to make it make it that people can wake up for the hour and a half yeah. even for a split second or something like that to have the direct experience that's not filtered out through 
con concepts, through preconceptions, through the way, you know, habitual behavior and perception, you know, that it's not going to be this, this experience that, oh, you go at 8.30, then you see the thing or hear the thing, and then, oh, you go for coffee and talk about it, then you go home and forget about it. I mean, <laughs> the things that I've always really appreciated in films, in live performances, or in reading, or anything else, is that it really stays with me. It's like changes the way that I think about things. Exactly. I mean, I think of both travel and writing as forms of alarm clocks. There are ways to wake yourself up in order to wake the reader up. The reason that I went to Los Angeles Airport, for example, was that at that point I'd been to maybe 25 or 30 countries, and in each case I'd gone there, spent two weeks absorbing things, come back, and written 20 pages on it. And I thought, well, now I know my own tricks. And I know almost before I begin where I'm going to end. And so all the freshness of discovery, which is where the energy comes from, is dissipated. So I have to force myself into a new kind of location where there are none of the obvious <laughs> advantages of exoticism. And it's going to Los Angeles airport and treating it as a foreign country is going to force me to approach things in, in a different way. And it's also, I now, more than visiting places, I revisit them. And that's as with Tibet. Because when I go to Tibet a second or a third time, having covered it once already, I can't fall into my familiar tricks. And I can't, I can't just go around noting the signs and, and the sights because I've done that once already. And so when you revisit a place, or I'm sure in your case revisit an idea, it's a way of instantly talking about memory or time or yes. change. How has this place changed? How have I changed? How is my mind making changes mm -hmm. that weren't there? And it, it instantly brings it inward. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've exhausted the external dialogue. Mm -hmm. But um, it's like when you meet a friend. Each time you, you meet that friend, a part of you needs the, uh, the solidity of re-establishing your contact. But a part of you wants to travel places you've never been before and try to you yeah. know, ask I mean, questions. I think, I think that's really interesting because I think as a lifetime of doing work, you know, in a way, it's like you also have to accept that some ideas are going to come back around again. Mm -hmm. So it's not only just, well, I have to, everything I do has to be new, new, new. Yeah. But, you know, then there's that doubt that, that I have when I, I, oh, I've done that idea already. But then I realize that's actually not, it's not accurate because these things do come back around again. Mm -hmm. You know, in a, in a way, as an artist, you only have one or two stories. Yeah. And that, that story comes back around, but with your wisdom and the growth that you've gone through in your life, and it's going to be a different solution or a different way of looking at it. So it's, it's a combination of trying to push past to something really new and at the same time accepting that no matter what you do, you are going to be that's the same person. Yeah. And that's, you know, whatever that means. And I think, you know, the yes, the process of art is about finding what your story is. I think before I began writing, I didn't really know what I cared about or what was most important to me. And one of the curiosities about writing, and I'm sure there are equivalents in you, in your life is and work, is that there are lots and lots of dramas in my life. People have tried to commit suicide in my room, my house burnt down, I've had members of my family who've, who've lost their minds, all kinds of stuff. And when I go to my desk, I don't have anything to say about them. Nothing in those experiences really touched me deeply. And yet I'll suddenly remember walking along the seafront in, on the Malecon in, in Havana on a morning where nothing was moving and nothing was happening in 1987. Or I'll suddenly remember being in a little room in Tibet with the high shafts of light coming through and a monk chanting in a corner. And somehow those moments have gone more deeply into me than the stuff that other people say, oh, you should write a book or make a movie That's of very, it. That's really um, interesting. And, and also the same, just as you're saying, the same themes keep coming up in spite mm -hmm. of oneself. And you suddenly realize, well, those are the issues that you're worrying mm -hmm. at, and utterly different from what you thought when you mm -hmm. um, you I, I feel the same way. I, I'm not able to use personal material like that. Yeah. You, some people are, yeah. but I always find that that's not, I, I have to always go to another step. I can't just u use that material. Well, this is my chance that I've got you in a public domain to ask you, do you have a sense of what your story or the themes that you were Well, I, I, I think that, you know, the, and this is back to what we were talking about in the beginning of this talk, is that I think that almost every piece I do has something to do with journey, mm -hmm. but it's much more about internal journey rather than external journey. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that a lot of my pieces are about um, uh, an outsider who ha who has a vision, an outsider of a, from from a society who has a vision, and um, and then I think that most of the pieces have some kind of sense of redemption in them. Do you think of mercy and impermanence? Do they go together? As the yeah, I think they're they're something? really contemplations uh, about things that can't can't be contemplated. <laughs> You know, it's real. I mean, how do you do a piece about mercy? How do you do a piece about impermanence? It's it's impossible. So the only way that you can you can just glance it. It's it's like a feather or something like that. And then you hope that there's a way of of uh, evoking. It's like evoking these energies that in both of those 
subjects. And, and in permanence, I, I think it was, it's very, it was very, very difficult. So I, uh, I actually got my idea for my structure when I was supposed to be meditating in a monastery in mm. Nova Scotia. Mm. And you know, you're supposed to say thinking, label thinking, and then you can't have the idea. You know, it's not. You can't go and write it down, but of course, as soon as I finish the meditation <laughs> session, I'm like, ah, I'm just thinking about it, you know. But uh, you know, it's like, well, how do you do a piece about impermanence? And so I got this idea of um, that actually it had to be like almost like a that at least the first part had to be more like a a crystal, so that it was these different sides. Mm. But it was very clear that one side was one side and another side was another side and that it didn't have to be linear in any way. It was actually just like looking at it this way and then turning it over another way mm -hmm. and, that that, you know, and that the images would, would add up by themselves. There was nothing that I had to do. You know, that, there was nothing I could really say about impermanence. It was just these images. Mm -hmm. And then the second half of the piece is much more like, uh, th is more like a river. Uh, you know, it's really like that there aren't boundaries. It's really like that, th that everything just flows from one from one aspect to the next, so it was a structural it was structural ideas that helped me mm. figure out how to work on it. It's interesting. I think one thing we have in common is spending a lot of time in monasteries, and I think probably for you as for me, <laughs> it's a way of stepping out yeah. of the swirl mm -hmm. and the moment. The better to understand it or to see the larger patterns that are enacted by it. Is yeah, it it's a great privilege to be able to have that time and space. I'm not how does it? You a well, to talk no, no, no. <laughs> it, well, they're not here to see me or hear me. It's, I was going to ask you, though, the same question. How does that spiritual practice, or that practice, I don't yeah. even name it, the practice, the meditation, does it affect the way that you work? Well, I'm glad you took the work. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I even have a practice, and I've never meditated. But it does affect the work. You're absolutely right. The fact that I spend I, four times a year for 15 years now, I go for long periods to a Benedictine hermitage in California, though I'm not Benedictine and I'm not completely a hermit. Uh, and I think it's, it's the one place where I'm delighted not to work. And this is probably something Meredith can understand. It's, uh, if I'm in, sitting in New York or at my desk, I feel every day I wake up and there's the piece, piece of paper confronting me and I better get something done. Mm -hmm. And that's the place where I'm delighted to have nothing done and get nothing done, leave everything aside and just absorb and inhale as much as possible. Just look out over the great blue plate of the Pacific 1,300 feet above, just try to count the stars at night, just to take long, long walks, almost to clear one system out in the confidence that as soon as I'm back in the world, I'll know exactly what I should do with the next six months of my life. And again, exactly what, um, what is important and tolling inside me. It's as if questions I didn't even know I had get answered and answer mm -hmm. themselves, precisely because I'm not trying to work. If I was at my desk and trying to figure out this is what should, what should I do the next year, I would just go round and round in circles. And one day I'd come up with an idea. That afternoon I'd contradict it. The next day I'd be back to the original idea. Here I leave the, the thinking behind. And when I get in my car to drive home, even after three days, I know what it is. And I think of it as a place of, of self-trust. And those aren't always easy to find in the world. But most of all, just a place of, um, of silence and stillness where you can hear you know, your intuition speaking or something. You know, it's so interesting because earlier you described seeing things and mm. observing, and then it switched to listening. Mm. And, and it went both from listening to other people to listening to yourselves. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. And, yes. and it, it really struck me because it's a, it feels like a different kind of process. Mm -hmm. Seeing is so yes. external in some ways, mm -hmm. and listening, yes. whether it's to yourself or others, mm -hmm. and of course the fact that you're both in some ways hoping there are listeners. Mm -hmm. there, there is an implication mm -hmm. that there are listeners there. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could also talk about that, that idea of listening, um, whether to the self or to others. Well, I think um, I just wanted to go on a little from what Pico was saying about the monastery. For me, I, it's also very much the same idea that I really can't, I can't work there. Uh, that it's a little different because I do do the meditation like for eight hours a day, but it really is, in, in a sense, mm -hmm. that is, that is the way that I also clean out, um, you know, all these, um, in a sense, of the, the external world. I, I feel like I have a chance to have a real internal work going on in, the, in that situation. <clears throat> and um, the last time I was there, which was 2003, I also decided not to bring books with me because I realized that books was also a way that I always escape, you know, from the moment. So uh, I only, you know, I didn't read, like, you know, mystery books or something like that, like I had the last time that I was, that was, a, that was a real, I realized, wow, reading is also a way that I get away from the moment. It's the, a, a little bit of an escape from, in a sense, 
I don't want to say this in a kind of morbid way, but from the pain of existence. Mm -hmm. Like I feel that, the, the, that there's this kind of ecstasy and pain of each mm -hmm. moment. Do, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I can't, mm -hmm. it's hard to express this, but existence itself has, has, a, has a sort of pain to it. Mm -hmm. It's a raw. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that's what, for me, I really appreciate having the time to do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also as a person, as a human being, not just the art part of it, but just the human yeah, being part of it. 